Well, I just want to praise God this afternoon on God's Holy Sabbath that I've been invited to uh, share my story. I want to thank Colin and uh, for his ministry here in our conference, and it's been a blessing. Amen? Amen. And we are just so blessed. Uh, I first met Colin last year. Uh, I heard that he was our uh, prayer coordinator, prayers ministries coordinator for the conference. And so I invited him to come and share uh, with our church at Grafton at the time last year. And since then, we've had a relationship, and it's so good to know that there are brothers in the church who are serious about prayer. Amen? Amen. And so he's invited me. My assignment today is to share my testimony and a sermon. And I thought about that for a bit, and I thought, um, my testimony is the sermon. <laughs> um, I know there are probably a few of you here today who've heard my story and like, oh, not again, Will. We've heard it already. So um, you'll just have to sit through it again. <laughs> Good to see you, Blair, our new young adults called, uh, dis- uh, director. Praise the Lord. Me and Blair go way back to college days. So, so And I also see a few faces in the crowd from Sydney. Uh, the Fong's there. God bless you. It's good to see you. And um, just wherever you're from, whatever church you're from, it's just a special day to um, worship together and to pray. I'm here this, this afternoon because somebody prayed for me. I'm here today because wasn't for my mother who prayed for me, I wouldn't be here today. And if you're sitting here this afternoon and you're here with your mother, then you should be praising God this afternoon. Because not only our mothers, but our fathers, uncles, aunties, our church family, have you heard that song, Someone is Praying for You? That rings true to my heart. And so the next 40 or so minutes, I'm going to share just a bit of what God's done in my heart. And uh, I want to share a little bit about the story of Elijah and his prayer on Mount Carmel. And then we're going to break up and pray uh, for those people who God has placed on our hearts. So if you don't mind, I'd just like to pray before we begin. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you once again for bringing us here today. To be reminded, Lord, that you are our creator. You give us rest. And Father, we thank you for the breath of life today. Lord, your word tells us in the book of Revelation that they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony. Lord, may that verse be applied this afternoon. And may every person here today think of their own testimony, what you've done in their lives. And may that reignite that flame where we can go out from this day and this weekend uh, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I'm um, just going to start my testimony. And um, I was born and raised in Sydney. So I know anyone else from Sydney here? All right, cool. Mars is from Sydney. That's right, represent. So I'm from Sydney, grew up in Sydney. I'm not going to share every aspect of my life, but I'm just going to go straight to where it all happened for me. I was 16 years old. Um, my little sister was just born. Um, and so in the Tongan culture, um, we took her back to church in Ashfield. So Ashfield's in the inner west of Sydney. And so in the Methodist tradition, baptism is basically a christening where you take your little baby to the front and the church priest or the pastor uh, drops a bit of water on the foyer and that, that was baptism. And so back in 1996, um, my family and I, we went back to uh, this church that um, all of our relatives and family went to. And so in 1996, when my little sister Layla was born, um, I was 16 at the time and so the big age gap. So when we went to our, I guess, home church, if you want to put it that way, I, I saw a lot of my friends and my family, my cousins that I haven't seen in so long. And so one of my cousins named Silas Marfu, he plays now overseas in, in England, I believe, or France, somewhere in Europe, he plays for a union team there. And so he was a couple of years younger than me. And so what I didn't realize about Silesi is that although he was going to church on Sunday, but he was actually um, hanging around with some boys in inner west of Sydney in a place called Burwood. And so uh, Silesi was kind of like 13, 14, I was 16, but the boys he was hanging around was a lot older than him. They were like 20s, you know, 20s plus. And so they had this group. And, and, and so you know how, I don't know, I'm a 90s baby. So I grew up in the 90s and um, in Sydney during that time, it was all about trying to be tough. It was all about trying to be cool and who you hung around. And so this Hollywood flick came out in 93 called Boys in the Hood. And I went to watch that and all my friends watched it. And so we were just engrossed in this American hip hop culture. Does anyone kind of relate to that? You don't have to put up your hand. That's okay. 
And so this is kind of my mindset. And so when Salesi, my cousin, invited me to Burwood where the boys used to hang out, I, I, immediately I was surrounded by all these Pacific Islander um, youth, like boys. And these were some pretty dangerous characters. I mean, they kind of got up to no good. They were in trouble with the law. You know, some of them did some crime. They did armed robberies. They went around beating people at night for no apparent reason. These were the type of thugs that I... When I met them, I, my mind, my heart like, was drawn to them. Is any young people there kind of look at other kids and go, wow, I want to be like them? No? Am I the only one here? All right. So I, I, I succumbed to what we call peer pressure. And so from 16 till about 18, 19, uh, I left high school. And my life basically became, went pretty dark pretty quick. Um, hanging around with some boys, as I said. So we had a group, we were basically hanging out and build, and, and every now and then they would get the street directory back in those days because they didn't have Google Maps. And so we had a st- book called The Street Directory. Does anyone still remember those things? Yeah, so we had this book, right? And so the boys would go to the back of it and look up all the different bowling clubs, pubs, clubs in all the areas, and they'd go and rob them. And so one particular night, I'm standing with the boys, and so they're all kind of doing their thing. I wasn't really into that stuff initially, but it got to a point where I started doing some of this stuff. And so I'm kind of hanging around these boys, and that's all they do is they think crime, they do crime, do all this type of stuff. And here's where it gets exciting for me. I'm, I'm, in, I'm outside Build Park, this place right on Build Strip, right in, across the road from Build Westfields. And so back in the day, this was, uh, used to be Build Plaza. It wasn't actually Westfields at the time. And so here we are, picture in your scene, right? All these 20, 30 Pacific Islanders, all brown skin looking like me. And we're all thinking we're cool. We're smoking our weed. We're drinking our beers. And we're drinking on the Fruity Lexia, the wine caskets and all this stuff. And so uh, all up until then, uh, a van just pulls up in front, of the, in front of the park. And so you know how we watch too much American movies. We're like, who are these people? rocking up to our neighborhood. You know what I'm saying? You know, we're watching all this stuff. on. Place. So we're thinking we're all these bad dudes. Because, you know, in, in Sydney in the 90s, you, different communities had their different ethnic, you know, groups. So you had all the Lebanese out at Punchbowl Bankstown. You had all the, uh, the Vietnamese out there in Cabramatta. And you had all the islanders were just kind of everywhere around Mount Jura, Campbelltown. And, you know, all these different subgroups, subcultures. So here we are in Bill Park. This van pulls up and it's a Maroon Tarago. I should realize it because it's belongs to my family. And so the van pulls up and it's actually my mum. And so the electronic windows go down. And can I just pause at this time and tell you that young Pacific Islanders are not scared of anyone or anything. Right, you got it. <laughs> They're scared of mum. So when mum pulled up in the Tarago, windows go down. You should see all the boys all sitting on this ledge and everyone's throwing away their cigarette and the weed and all this stuff. And so mum calls me to the van and she basically says, William, I'm going to Tonga. Uh, my grandmother's sister had passed away. And so she said, um, you want to come with me? Now, I need a pause again. This is 2001, January. And um, I was about to have my 21st that next month. And I had been planning this birthday for months. And so here I am, my 21st is in a matter of weeks. And so mum pulls up to Bill Park and basically says, you want to come with me to, um, to my grandmother's sister's funeral? You know, she was a big thing back in Tonga. And she's, so I'm like, how long are we going for, mum? She's like, well, we're just going for a week. And so I'm like, okay. I thought to myself, oh, I'll go for a free holiday, come back, it's all good. But some of the boys right sitting behind me speaking in pig Latin saying, no, nah, don't go, don't go. It's a setup, it's a setup. Now, I know you're not kind of reacting because you don't understand. In the Pacific Island culture, when your parents want to really kind of discipline you, they send you back to the islands. <laughs> Me and the boys, we call it Guantanamo Bay. That's our little... <laughs> and so some of the boys, because they've experienced this. One of them just came back. He was in Hapai for five years. It's, it's not a joke. He went there and we never saw him again. <laughs> so I'm thinking, uh, all right, I'll come with you. I'm so short end of it, I went with my mother, went to Tonga, went for the funeral. And then right there when I was in Tonga, my mum kind of had sat me down and had one of these, you know, heart to heart talks. And she basically just poured out her heart to me. And she said, you know, William, look at your life. Basically, I'm just rephrasing. She says, um, your life's going nowhere. Um, I, my brother, Josh, a year younger than me, he was serving time in Windsor. I had a younger brother, four years younger. He was at the juvenile detention center in Reby out in Campbelltown. 
And my little sister was five and she didn't even know who I was. And so my mom is kind of breaking down and she's crying. She's pouring her heart out to me. She goes, William, I just want you to, just please, you know, she's, I've been praying for you. Please, I just, 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 I don't know what to do with you. And so, so I think you should just stay here for a while and just see what happens here in Tonga. And I'm like, a while? You've got to understand, it's my 21st next month. So what do you mean, mom, an extra week, an extra two weeks? Like, what are you thinking? And she goes, just stay here for a few years and see what happens. A <laughs> few years. That was a death sentence. <laughs> so I said, I'm not staying here, you know. So anyway, a few couple of days later, I'll go to my uncle's house, you know, just live down the road. And I say, where's mom? And they said, didn't you know, mom's, she's gone back to Sydney. <laughs> you know, and I went home and scrummaged looking for my stuff. She took my passport with her. So I was so, so mad. I couldn't wait till she got back home, till she landed at, in Sydney Airport. And I rang her up and basically, you know, I was very angry at her. That's the, to put it mildly. <laughs> and I basically told my mom, Mom, if you want me to stay here, I'm not going to stay with all my family. I want to stay on my own. So she looked for a place for me and I ended up staying right in the heart of town in Nugalofa. It was just uh, about 500 meters or so from the King's Palace right there in the middle of town, right opposite where the army barracks. And so this happened in January. And by the way, I ended up spending my 21st in Tonga. <laughs> it was dismal. Sitting around a carver bowl, grown men just playing for hours on a guitar. It was just, it wasn't good. I was picturing all the boys. It was all about the boys in Sydney. So anyway, I end up staying in this little apartment just, uh, you know, in town. A few months later, um, in May, I uh, was going to the store to buy some food. If I could just pause here, you know, th this whole story is about Jesus. If I could kind of pause right here and kind of describe to you my mindset is I didn't know God. I, I didn't know him like I know him now. There's a text in Jeremiah where he says, can the Ethiopian change his skin? You know, uh, can the leopard change his spots? And can you do good or accustomed to do evil? And, and I remember when my boys, when we hang around and we drink and smoke and, and something in me wanted to change, but, but I couldn't change myself. And I hated myself because I was doing stuff and I hated the person I'd become. That, that's who I was when I was 21 years old back in Tonga. And so I'm in Tonga. And Tonga, by the way, is a very religious place. Church is everywhere. I live right across the road from this huge church. And a few months later in May, I'm going to the store to buy some food. And so I go to the store to buy some food. And, you know, it was a pretty dark lit night that, that evening. So back then, my diet really consisted of like tin fish and bread. That's pretty much all I ate, like every day. And so, you know, those big loaves of bread where it's not sliced, you just open it up dunk a bit of butter in there and put a can of mackerel down there. That was my dinner. Just hold it like a pint. <laughs> Chomp on it while I'm watching the Tonga news. In May, I go to the store and buy my fish and my, my bread and stuff. And as I was turning around to go back home, I noticed that behind the counter, behind the lady, was the front page of the, the Tongan Times, the Taimi Tonga. And my Tongan wasn't really that good to, to read it as such, but I could catch what the title said. Something about a robbery that happened in Australia. And it was a big scene, people, you know, handcuffed, you know, all that stuff. So I took the paper thinking, I might even know who's in it. Just the thought. Bought the paper for a dollar. And this is where it all happened to me. This is where God began to change my life. I, I bought the paper and I opened the first page. And as I perched, I just skimmed past the first two paragraphs. And I kid you not, seven of them got arrested. Two carloads went, robbed the Liverpool Catholic Club. It's a huge place. looks like a casino. They took it over. They got caught. And when I'm reading all of the names of the boys who are involved, were the very boys that I was standing with on Build Road back in January. Now, don't, don't ask me, well, why did he do that to you and to the other boys? I don't know. That's just what happened. And so I remember when I started reading the boys, I could, I could see their names. 
this person, 19, this person, 17, this person. And it tells them what happened. You see, one of them just turned 18 on May the 1st. They didn't have any money, so they wanted to have a huge party. So all they do, they wanted to, to go and rob this place. They all got busted. And so here I am in May in the islands of Tonga, far away from my friends and my family. I'm reading about these boys. And, and when I read it, it just, it, I just stopped there. Firstly, I was just shocked about it all. Secondly, I was kind of grieving because these boys got, you know, got locked up and everything. But, but all of a sudden, it, it, that was really just, it just led me to just start thinking about life. And so I walked back to my, my, ta- my little townhouse there where I was staying in Tonga. And, and you know, right next to my house was a water tank. And, and so I, I climbed on that water tank and I, and I just climbed up the top and I sat there. And that particular night in the islands, it was a beautiful night. It was one of those nights where those, the stars are just out there, you know, those beautiful nights. And it, the, the stars were so close as, as if they, you could just grab them. And let me tell you something, as a 21-year-old, when I was sitting on that water tank, I was so lonely because I didn't know who I was. I was thinking about my family. My brothers were in jail. My little sister didn't know who I was. I felt so alone in that place. And so in the, in the loneliness of my heart, I was looking out at the stars and I remember the, the stories that my grandfather used to tell me about. I remember the, the church songs that I used to listen to growing up and the prayer times and all this. And, and I looked out to the stars and I don't know how it is for you, but when I looked out at the stars at night, I didn't verbalize these words, but my heart was saying, God, if you're out there, I want to know you. I don't know. I, I, don't, I think I was just desperate. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do with my life. So at that moment, I, I opened my heart to the Lord. I just said, God, please help me. Please help me. Now, I remember my mom still sending me stuff from the island, or from Sydney. And, you know, she'd send me stuff and she would send the Daily Telegraph. I'd almost have an emotional you know, crying, reading what's going on in Sydney. And she'd send all my old Michael Jordan videos. I used to love playing basketball. She sent a whole bunch of stuff. And then right under the bottom of the whole box, there was, a, there was an old paperback New King James Bible. And I started reading that. And I remember reading that text in Jeremiah. You, you probably know that text very well. Where God says, I know the thoughts I have towards you. You know that text, right? God says, I've got plans to prosper you, to give you a future and a hope. And I love what the text says. It says, you'll call upon me and you go and pray to me. And what does God say, church? He says, I will listen to you. God says he wants to listen to us. So when I read that as a 21-year-old, I was like, wow, God says that, that if I talk to him, he's going to listen to me. But then there was that clincher right on verse 13 that I wasn't really sure if I really wanted to go all the way with it, where God says, he says, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Now, that took a while for me to look at because I wasn't, I wasn't sure if I was going to be willing to give God everything that I had. And so when I was reading the text, I said, God, help me to give you my heart because it's hard for me. Help me to follow you. And you know, I can't explain that peace that I had, how I met Jesus. I met Jesus on that water tank. Now, I believe God was calling me, you know, before that. And, and in all through our experiences, we, we look back and we realize that God puts people in our places. He gives us opportunities and places where we get to connect and hear the voice of God. But I wasn't open to hearing that voice. But on that water tank, back in 2000 in May, 2001, I heard God's voice. And it was that deep inner voice saying to me, William, give me your heart. Look what you've been doing. It's not giving you peace. It's not satisfying you. And so that began a journey. I ended up staying there for about nine months, came back at the end of October, ish September, October, I can't remember. And I think I'd convinced my mum because she wasn't sure. Because when I first had that experience in May, um, I would write letters to the boys in Glebe. We used to hang out in this one of the boys' homes in Glebe Street, right there in the inner city. 
and you know they'd be reading the my letter you know like oh look you know give your life to god and all this stuff so i came back uh end of 2001 i had friends who were um going to hillsong church in the, in sydney right there in Woolloomooloo. and so they would invite me there and within a few months i was baptized when i came back from sydney or came back from tonga started going to that church for a bit and you know i was loving like going to that church in Hillsong and I was kind of, you know, I was just so keen because I felt so empty and I felt I found something. I'd found someone. A couple of years later, and I just want to share a little bit about how I came to know, um, understand who we are as a people of the church. I had a friend who lived in Concord, which was next door to Bellwood. And so every Saturday he'd walk past the, the church and he'd go to uh, build Oval, that's where the West Harbour Pirates train. And so he was, you know, into his football thing. So one Saturday morning, he's going to training and he realizes he rocks up one morning and he's there at 10 o'clock, 10.30, no one's there. And so he's going, did I get the time wrong? What happened? So he's waiting there, 10, 10.30, 11. So there's no training on. He realized he missed it. So he walks back home. And as he's walking back home, he walks past the church building. And the, the sign that particular morning does anyone have church building, uh, church signs in front of their churches? You know, people read them, you know, including my friend, which I'm about to show you. The, the sign that, that morning said, get spiritually fit, walk with Jesus. Now, if you heard my story, this is where it gets to be funny. I don't know what happened with my friend. He's a bit fresh. He, he's there with his football shorts and his footy boots. So he thought something's going on there of a physical nature. So he walks in there, and what did he realize? He walked into a church service. He sat in the back, and he was listening to Dominic, the head elder, take the sermon. And so my friend Favor was, was we walked into church, so he didn't realize what he was getting himself into. And, and so from that moment, they began studies, Dominic and Favor. And so after that, a few months later, he's telling me, William, you've got to come to these studies. It's awesome. You know, I'm learning so much. And I said to myself, no, no, Favor, I know, I know your type. You're only going to this church to so some girls there, isn't it? That's why you're going to that church. And so I said, I better come to this church. And so the next week, no, not for that, but I just wanted to check it out. So I go to the church the next Sabbath, and let me tell you, there was hardly anyone there. There was like 10 folks there, and they're all elderly. And I said, okay, but I'll tell you what. I still remember Edgar. He greeted me that morning. He's sleeping in Jesus right now. He welcomed me, hugged me, and oh, yeah, yeah, young man, and he gave me the biggest bear hug, and that just ooh, the, the love was just, oh, it was just consuming me. You know, and, the, and we, we had lunch there, and, and I just for some reason I kept going back and back and back. And then slowly my friends started not going, and I was going for it. I'm like, this guy gets me into it, and now I'm going for it all the way. One particular day after church, me and Favor, we left, and we were gonna go to another mate's house and so we went to his house and he's like oh William just just wait in the just just wait here while I change and get ready and we'll we'll go to the, one of the boys house and so I'm sitting there and he goes oh, just watch this video while I'm getting changed and so he presses play and it's um what do I hear it's like welcome to the millennium prophecy with Doug Batchelor and I'm like I'm 20 like three now, four, I'm like, who is this guy? And so he was like preaching the prophecies and he was, I was so consumed by this. I said, where'd you get this video from? And he's like, oh, I got it from the church. I said, is there only one of these? He said, they got a whole, they got a whole library of these things. And so I started watching these Million of Prophecy DVDs. I was consuming them. I couldn't wait till I watched them. I, I just watched the whole thing in like a week. I was just consumed and, and God spoke to me through those uh, presentations. And it touched my heart. And you know what the crazy thing about it is? Is that that was a big part of me knowing Jesus. When I was baptized in March 20, 2004, three months later, Sydney Conference had a had our, uh, our big camp, so to speak, in Homebush. And you know who the guest speaker was? It was Doug Batchelor. I was like, wow, this is crazy. I'm watching about this guy on TV and here I am and he's right there in front of me. I was like, it was awesome. You know, I, I, looking back now, my life now, as opposed to some 10 odd years ago. When I was standing in front of Bell Park, in front of that road and hanging with the boys and, and mum invited me to Tonga, I don't know what would happen if I said no. I'm not sure. I know God has a thousand ways to kind of woo us back to him because Jeremiah said he's constantly drawing us. But, but just that little step and just reading about the boys and, and kind of seeing my life for what it was 
uh, you know, God began to speak to me and say, Will, you got it all messed up. It's not about hanging with the boys. It's not about trying to be cool. It's not trying to be somebody you're not. You are a child of God. I made you. I created you. I got a plan for you. And if you'll just listen to me, I will make your life a hundred times more exciting and more fulfilling and more passionate than you could ever live outside of me. And so I love that text in Jeremiah 9 where Jeremiah says, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Some of you know that text. Neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him who glories glory in this. Some of you know it. That he understands and knows me. I want to tell you today I know God. Now, I don't, I'm not telling you that I'm perfect. I'm not telling you that I'm just, I'm just this holy man that just, no, I, I, I'm, a, I'm like you. I wrestle with the flesh. I wrestle with the old man. And every day, like my brother here said, we have to say we are crucified with Christ. And so, so for me now, it was all about I didn't know who I was. When I was with those boys, I didn't know who I was. I thought I was running with the UTB. No. I didn't know I was running with, from God. When I was on that plane to Tongatapu, I didn't know. God wanted to speak to me. When I came back from Sydney and I was looking for a church and I was looking for God, I was in a Pentecostal church one day. I started going back to my old Methodist church and I was searching for God and He was wooing me back to Him. And so for Jeremiah, he says, if you want to glory, if you want to boast, if you want to find value in anything, find it in the fact that you know God. And I stand before you today, my brothers and sisters, not that I'm a perfect man. I stand before you because I know Jesus. I know what he did for me. And you're sitting here today. You've got your own story. Don't forget that story because that's the story that keeps me going as a young man, as I, as I continue to serve Jesus. That's what keeps me going because I remember what happened to me when I was 21 years old. When I was sitting on that water tank, I know what Jesus has done for me. And so when we're talking about this prayer conference, if I could just transition very briefly before we pray, I want to just talk very quickly about Elijah's prayer. Elijah's prayer on Mount Carmel in 1 Kings 18. Um, the story, we, we're pretty familiar with the story, right? There was a there was a drought in the land because of the judgments that God had pronounced upon the Israelites. And so God raised up Elijah. He goes into the place where King Ahab was, told him there'll be no more rain. And so there's this whole story. But what I don't do is I just want to fast forward to that part, 1 Kings 18, where it gets to the Mount Carmel experience. Elijah said, you grab your false prophets, you grab them and you come here and, and I'll set up my altar, you set up your altar and the God who answers by fire, he's the true God. We all know the story, right? And so we know what happened and how the false prophets couldn't, they couldn't call fire down and they were dancing around the altar and they were cutting themselves and were, they were just desperate for Baal to answer their prayer. And Elijah's standing on the side going, okay, well, you, you finished, you know, he's kind of waiting on them. And then when it got to the time of the evening sacrifice, I just want to highlight three very quick things that Elijah prayed for in his prayer. He gathered, what is the first thing he did? He called the people and he said, come here, come near. And he got the old altar and he repaired it, right? Repaired the altar. And he got the stones. And then he got the, the sacrifice, got the wood, and he told them to pour a bucket of water over it four times. Dig a, dug a trench around it. We know the story, right? But when we get to the heart of that story, I just want to highlight Elijah's prayer. I see three things happening in that story. And I'd like it to be the basis of how we lead into our prayer time in just a few moments. The first thing that Elijah says in his prayer, 1 Kings 18, 36, he says, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Why do you think he prayed, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Yeah, he was praying to the God who keeps his covenant. 
God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He was, he was calling God as the one who had, who had saved them in the past, the one who spoke to Abraham, the one who spoke to Isaac, the one who spoke to Jacob. He said, and, and I can imagine as the, the people, the Bible just calls them the people. These were Israelites, there were the, mix, there were the false prophets there, but, but this was for God's people to realize who he really was. And so he addresses this, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. I see two things in that. Firstly, Elijah's calling God to remember his covenant, not like he never forgot, but he's reminding the people there that we are serving a God who keeps his promise. Amen? That's the first thing I see in this prayer. And then he says, Lord God, acknowledge me. Let these people know that not only you are the God of Israel, but you have sent me and I am your servant. Sometimes I realize in that story, people don't realize that till after the fire falls, right? Till they see the miracle, then they realize that you have sent them. But until then, they see you as your enemy. They see them as someone who's against you or you're against them. But Elijah prayed, let them know that I've been sent by you. I mean, you can't blame Elijah because he's standing there on his own, right? And there's 450 false prophets and he's standing there alone. And what's Elijah praying? Elijah, uh, Lord, let them know that I'm standing here for you. You know, sometimes when we go through our Christian experience, we feel like we're the only one standing for God. But we all know the story of Elijah, right? What what did God remind Elijah? I have how many? 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. A couple more minutes and then we'll, we'll pray. First thing God, Elijah prays for is for God to remember his covenant. Why was that so important? Because the children of Israel were told in Deuteronomy chapter 28, here are the blessings if you follow God and here are the curses. And one of the blessings was that he will pour down his rain on you, he'll give you an abundant harvest. He will make your crops grow. You'll be fruitful in everything you do. And what did God say? The curse was if you disobey me, you forsake my covenant, my law. He goes, I will cause the rain to cease from the land. And so what was Elijah doing? He was calling God to remember his covenant that he spoke right there years ago. Elijah also prays that he may be acknowledged. And the last one I'd like to close on this before we pray is right there in that prayer, right at the end. He says, hear me, O Lord, that they may know that you are God and you have turned their hearts back again. I love that because what I hear in Elijah's prayer is Elijah's crying out to God saying, God, please let them know that it's not me that's making this all happen. It's not me that's kind of being this crazy man. This is all you, right? So Elijah's praying, Lord, let them know that it's you calling them back. It's not me. I love this, the sermon this morning, Pastor Kepsi, and it's talking about reconciliation. Sometimes when we want to bring about this reconciliation in our churches, in our, amongst our friends, family, sometimes they think it's us trying to initiate this, uh, this, this, this thing, right? But it's not us, it's who? It's God that's working in us. And so three things before we pray this afternoon. What does Elijah pray for? He prays that God may honor his word, and he is a God who keeps his promises. I want us to know that today we are just as chosen and for the work and God wants to use us just as much as he used Elijah on Mount Carmel. The third is is that Elijah was praying that when it was all said and done, that everybody would know that it was God that initiated, it was God who started it and it was God who finished it. Amen? I'd like to, before we pray, I just thought about this. Mount Carmel is a symbol of deception and blindness. That's what Ellen White says. It was on that mount represented the deception that was prevailing amongst the Israelites and the blindness. Before we break up and pray, Colin asked us to name 10 people that we would like to write down and pray for. Can I suggest to you that in our prayer time this afternoon, each one of us, there is someone on Mount Carmel that we know. What do you mean by that, Will? 
I mean there's someone in your friendship, someone in, even in your church, someone that you uh, mingle with and associate with, if they don't know the true gospel of Jesus Christ that saves them and sets them free, to some degree they are in a level of deception or blindness. And I'd like to pray that as a church and as a conference this afternoon, that, that we pray for those people who are in or on Mount Carmel. Mount Carmel's exist today. There's people be, being deceived left, right, and center. Jesus said in Matthew 24, three times, deception will be one of the, last, the, one of the things of the last days, verse 5, 11, and 24. So as we close... And as we spend some time praying, let's remember that God has his people out there. And perhaps they're waiting for an Elijah. Maybe they're waiting for someone to call them out on where they are and tell them that there is a God who loves them. But that won't happen until we pray that prayer of Elijah. Someone's out there in your friend, someone in your home. I've got people I'm thinking about right now as I stand here. I'm thinking about my younger brother. I'm thinking about people that are in my short time of pastoring. They don't come to church because either they're A, uh, hurt, they're, they're guilty, or they did something so bad they feel they can't come back. So whatever it is that's stopping them from coming back, to some form or another, they are still on Mount Carmel. And we, as the people of God, are invited to call them back. Amen? So could we do that in the next, I'm going to call Colin to the front. We're going to ask that we will separate into groups. We need to, okay. Can I just close with a prayer and then we'll do this, the second part. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, I just want to thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for the, the way you've led in my life. I pray for everyone here today that they will see you for who you are. That the greatest thing on this earth on this side of eternity is to know you. As Jesus said, this is life eternal, that they might know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. And Father, as a result of this weekend, may we go out and may we share the gospel of Jesus before he returns. We pray in his most precious name. Amen.